Hi, I'm Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go to support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. Welcome everybody to another edition of Miracle Voices. I'm Matthew McCabe. I'm here with my co-host, Judy Scutch Whitson. Hi, Judy. Good morning, Matt. For me, I guess you're in Portugal, so it's good evening for you. Yes, yes, good afternoon. Well, good evening. Yes, good evening. And also special guest here, Tam Morgan. Tam, welcome to the show. Not so special, but hi. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, I want to go ahead and jump in uh, to the episode here, but maybe before we do, we can just get a little sense of who you are, Tam, Um, you know, co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace. Can you give us a little background about who you are? I'm still learning who I am and who I'm not. Um, I happen to be this woman who's sitting next to me, who is <laughs> Judith Dutch Whitson. I happen to be her daughter. And as co-president of the foundation with Dr. Robert Rosenthal, um, I am learning every day, as they say, who I am and who I'm not. And I have roles that I play, but I, they don't really matter to me. <laughs> so uh, who I have been is helping to serve A Course in Miracles and its um, distribution and it's the discussion about it and really bringing it to anyone in this world who it resonates with. That's That's been my role through the foundation. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and publishing. publishing okay. So that's, that's that role. Cool. And I am in service as well to my mother. I came into this organization um, very much to help her uh, and finding how much it's helping me. Yeah. And Tim, this, this podcast, the theme is forgiveness and healing. Uh, a lot of people who are listening are familiar with the concepts of forgiveness, but it's always kind of nice to get a personal, you know, a personal idea of how you think about the concept of forgiveness as it relates to the core, the course. Again, I'm learning daily about what it means. So the story that I'm going to tell is so recent. And um, Matt, you asked me if it was, you know, so recent that it was too raw for me to tell. I don't know the answer to it, but I do know it's uh, timely and that it's in the present okay. and it's not a past memory. I feel that he, what I have been learning about healing and forgiveness, the concept that something never actually happened is an incredibly difficult concept sometimes when we are in this level of illusion and body belief. Um, the Where it connects with healing for me is in returning to love. I probably should jump in here, Matt, and add that for those people who are newcomers to this podcast, A Course in Miracles is a book that helps us learn our identity, and it is a system of non-duality. Therefore, our identity is not in the ego or the world of form as we see it, or what we call this world. Our actual identity is in our creator's extension, or in other words, our creator created us exactly as itself, and it doesn't mean an old man up in a chair looking down at us and deciding what should happen to us. But rather it says that we made this world, God did not, and it is our misperception. And this misperception of the world that we made and that we identify with must be corrected. So A Course in Miracles really is a system of correction 
whereby we find out through studying it and practicing it what we truly are and is really only by the experience that we learn it. Therefore, we have a text which outlines its concepts and then we have a workbook for students which is to practice these concepts and we have a manual for teachers which is to help us identify with the teacher within, which we call the Holy Spirit, but one could call it the higher teacher or the higher source or anything one wants to that is of that domain. Uh, As we talk about forgiveness, we're talking about recognizing that in this world that the ego made, many, many horrible things happen and they happen to us and they happen to the world that we made, but that is not who we are. And the only way to remember our identity is to recognize through the path of forgiveness in a different way by asking our higher source to help us, asking the Holy Spirit for guidance, we then perceive the situation of wrong doing in a totally different way. And we have the experience, the experience more and more and more that this world of form is not where we live in truth. Great intro, Judy. Thank you for that. Tam, if you're up for it, would you like to share your forgiveness story? <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, I would. Okay. I'm, I'm really not sure how it's going to come out, but I'm just going to hand it over. Um, I've been in deep caregiving mode for the past several years. Um, my Stepmother passed away and before she was sick and I would show up in New York to take care of her. And a month later, my stepfather in California passed away and it was more of a shock and quick and the caregiving became um, about stepping in with my mother. And uh, then my father recently died in um, during COVID, but not from COVID. And caregiving about his estate and caregiving before he died in, in extreme. And my mother, who is has just turned 90, who, who needs care um, as well. So it's been a very, very big role in my life. And my friends have watched this. And I'm a caregiver by heart uh, and by nature. And I had a friend who months ago, um, Christmas, decided she wanted to give me a massage. And as a gift, not to send me to someone else for a massage who came highly recommended by another friend who had gone to this person, a man, for 12 years. And she kept bugging me about it. Like, did you get your massage yet? No, I'm too busy. No, I'm too busy. And finally, my, you know, birthday came. You, you know, you still haven't even gotten your massage for Christmas. Too busy. So a few weeks ago, um, now about two and a half, three weeks ago, I finally thought, okay, I am, she kept saying, you could just take one and a half hours to yourself and do this, give yourself something. I was like, I really need to. So I didn't even tell everyone at work. I just, I stole the, this hour and a half for my life. And I went to this person um, and I was on his table and I just kind of collapsed into Oh my God, thank you. Thank you for this gift. And I'm being massaged and I'm noticing he's getting to what I feel inappropriate. And I'm not saying anything and I'm starting to cave a little bit about this. Like, is this inappropriate what he's doing? Is it not? He's going closer to my inner thigh. He's starting to massage my chest. And I'm thinking, this this doesn't feel quite right. And then he actually asked me, you know, is this okay? And I find myself saying yes. And every part of me felt no. But I find myself saying yes. And I start to cave and freeze. And he does a massage that became very inappropriate for me. I didn't know what to say. And I, when I left the massage, I froze and I left. And I didn't say a word about it. I, 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 it was an interesting thing for me because I stole away to get the massage. Then I stole away 
and ran away from the massage. But at that massage, something was stolen from me. And I couldn't figure out exactly what I was feeling because I was in a frozen state around it. And it took several days before it came out uh, for me that this had even happened. And one of the ways that it came out was was that a, a friend who I hadn't talked to in a very long time called me up, who was an intuitive, and called me up with a French accent and said, I've, I have COVID for the second time, I'm asleep, and I want you to know you, a oh, truth, truth wants you to know you've been molested. And I was like, oh, thank you for this. <laughs> thank you for the universe telling me something, add up, just acknowledging something for me. And I realized this and I had to digest it and I felt guilty that I hadn't said something. And I'm trying at this time deeply to practice course print principles. Um, you know, the some of the course principles about being a victim and me not wanting to be a victim, but my tendency in the past is to override with spirit and to override um, by saying, okay, we're all one, this is okay, this wasn't a big deal, um, but that I'm getting deeper and deeper into practice to seeing what this actually means for me. And in that it's becoming, my becoming more and more present. So I felt like my first step was really to acknowledge the body and this level of illusion and what actually happened to me and how could I have put myself into this feeling of victimhood. And for me, I was a, um, I was subjected to abuse over the course of six years in my childhood. So I have this trigger about it. And part of the trigger is that when I get triggered, I either blow up or I get really quiet inside. And in a situation like this, I got very quiet and paralyzed. Um, and so I'm starting to realize this and I bring this to a therapist and some, a couple of friends. And in it, I find out that another friend that I know um, went through the same thing with this man and actually called him out on it with our mutual friend who recommended this man and nothing really happened. And she, to, for her to find out that now it happened to me was very upsetting. And we walked through it together because first of all, being with this friend who I'll call Valerie um, was really empowering. Oh, we both experienced the same thing in this level of illusion. And how do we want to respond? How do I want to respond to this? So my first response was I call, acknowledging it, calling the mutual friend who, who, we'll call Sarah, who recommended this person. And I said, you know, this happened to me. And I actually called her before I knew another person had had this experience. This happened to me. Have you had any problems? And she said, no, I've known this person for 12 years and I really care for him, but I support you doing anything you need to do for yourself in this. And I said, okay. Uh, and I had to decide what is, what is a way, what, can I do to take care of myself in this where I don't choose to be victim and I want to bring the highest good? Is it to call the police right now? Is it to call, what do I do here? So I wrote a very clear, strong letter um, to this person and I copied different people on it. And I, I said, you know, this is illegal in the United States. Uh, this is illegal from California Medical Association, although he was not licensed. And um, what I need is to see, but I know we're in Marin and it's like people do do sensual massage. I need to see that this never happens again and that there's written form of consent beforehand because I didn't get to decide before the massage. 
I didn't get to decide before the massage. And in this, I went, you know, I went to my partner, uh, my boyfriend, and I hadn't really talked to him about it and realized why. Like the first week he said, what's going on? And he said, you seem frozen. And I said, I do feel frozen. And then the next week, as I'm realizing, oh, my gosh, I actually was molested here. What does this mean? I brought it to him and I I said, you know, I, I'm feeling, I didn't tell him what was going on yet. And I said, he said, what's going on? And I said, I feel like a hot mess. And he said, wait, that's, you know, you, you're frozen and a hot mess. How is that possible? And I said, let me tell you how. And I am confusing the chronology a little. This was before I confronted the person who I will call Dylan, the masseuse. Um, and I told him of this experience that I had and his response was so interesting because he is working on waking up as well uh, in whatever ways that means. And he was holding me and he was saying, I'm, I am so sorry this happened for you. And I said, what are your feelings about it? And he said, well, my first feeling is I want to go, you know, punch him, kill him. You know, like I have anger about it. And I have another feeling I don't want to share. And I said, what is that? And he said, I'm so embarrassed to tell you. And I said, I want to know, because this is a core of what I feel is going on just in, I I work with non-duality, but there is still duality that I'm working through. And in feminine, masculine principles of what's going on here, what are you really feeling? And he said, this is horrible. One part of me is feeling, wow, it's, it's, I'm not feeling this. I am hearing a voice on my shoulder that I struggle with my whole life that says, wow, if you were just more aggressive, see how much more sex you'd get. And I was appalled at this answer. And every part of me wanted to yell at him. And I kept hearing my course practice. I am not a victim. He is not a victim. How do we rise to this? If I yell, it will only cause a fight between us. He is trying to tell me something. How can I listen and really listen to what he's trying to tell me? And instead of yelling or going, are you kidding me? This is what you're telling me when I tell you I'm abused. Oh, you could have gotten more sex if you were a more aggressive man. What I said to him, can you explain this further to me? And he said, yes, there is a voice that's been indoctrinated in my head from a young child, from this culture of, if you're a good man, you're a wimp. If you reach out and you're aggressive and you get things, then you get them. And I have fought this my whole life because I'm I think of myself as a good man, but this voice diminishes me every day and it tries to take over and it actually tortures me that if when I do the right thing, I'm not rewarded, I'm seen as a wimp. And then I go into fantasy and I drool over women and then it goes to the other side and I'm a wimp instead of a good man. And I am, I am working on being a good man. And I started to cry in this because I realized, oh my gosh, what men have to go through and and their misperceptions of how to be here. And I held him and he held me and it was so incredible. And I said, I'm sorry that you struggle with that. And he said, basically, thank you for hearing me for the first time, really hearing me. And I said, you're welcome. I'm sorry I haven't in the past because instead I just get angry when he talk about that voice as if it were him. Um, And so that was a first amazing forgiveness opportunity. And the next morning he sent me an article that came out in the New York Times and it was about a dominatrix who never knew how to say no. And she's, and in this article, she made it so clear that the there are several aspects when you've been abused of the, the women who've been abused. Um, and there's four different ways of 
you know, dealing with abuse and there's fright and there's flight and there's the four F's there's like fawning or giggling or, Oh, you know, acting like it's okay that way. And then there's freeze, which is really a hugely most common one. And the freeze is to collapse and not be able to say no, get through it, move on. And, and in her world over and over again, when things were happening, she didn't want to happen. Even though she was the strong woman, she didn't know how to say no and how she had to learn to say no. And when my partner sent me this, he goes, now I understand what you're talking about. And I read this and I went, now I understand what I'm talking about. Like, thank you for this gift. And so I had this kind of in my toolbox now. And I I wrote this letter of what I need to know from you know, what I need to see moving forward to this man, for, from this man, Dylan. And I had the support of these two friends. And I also got to read the email that my first, the first friend, Valerie, who had been abused by this man as well, wrote. And she said, and she's a very strong, very strong, very vocal woman about everything, very opinionated. And I read her email to him And it was the nicest thing I'd ever heard. She went, you know, dear Dylan, uh, you are an incredibly talented masseuse, but I felt like you got a little inappropriate. And so I won't be coming back to you. And she remembered that email as being strong. And he wrote back, I'm sorry you didn't like my extra nurturing. And if you want to come back some other time, you know, and reset, we can do that. And I'm like, both of us are rereading and wanting to throw up. So I write this strong email that to this man that was very clear and I got input and I got support and I felt so held by community of like, look, you don't have to attack there, reminding me course lessons. No, I don't have to attack there. I don't have to attack there. And I, um, I wrote this and I got uh, a response And I said, I want refunds. I, you know, I don't want to have anyone pay for this in any way, shape or form, even financially. And he said, fine on the refunds. And I'm sorry, I misinterpreted your wishes. And my initial response was wishes. So if I, you came to me and I kicked you in the balls uh, and I said, oh, sorry, I misinterpreted without ever talking in the beginning, if this is something you want or giving that opportunity from a place where you're not stimulated, where actually you're not triggered, a place of health to make a choice. And I'm learning about this at the same time. So when I get this response from him, I realize, no, this isn't the response I want. And I speak to Valerie and she says, I need to call the police. And I need to report this. And I think, um, you know, let's write Yelp reviews and just make women aware this is going on. And I thought I want to call this man's partner, business partner, who's a woman and let her know what's going on as well. And uh, but what I when I stopped and meditated and kept doing the course practice, I kept hearing something different. I kept hearing I need to see this differently. And in this, I'm, my son has come home from New York for for a, a visit and he comes into me and I'm struggling. How do I want to deal with this? How do I want to deal with this? And my son said, mom, what's been going on? You've been very quiet. I'll come into the room and you'll stop talking to whoever you're talking. And I said, there's something going on, but I don't want to impose it on you. And he's he's said, I need to hear this. I need to hear what's going on. So I said very carefully and quietly, I went to a massage and I was molested. And my son burst into tears. He absolutely burst into tears. And he said, I'm so sorry. And he came and he held me and he was sobbing. And every part of me felt, this is what I needed. Here's a man and he's crying with me about it. And my son said, 
And I, the first thing that came out was I said, I'm sorry, I didn't want to bring this to you. And he said, don't you dare say I'm sorry in this. Please instead say I did nothing wrong. And I couldn't say it. And he said, please say I did nothing wrong, mom. You have to say it three times for me. And I was like, okay. And by the third time I said it, I was sobbing. And the two of us were holding each other sobbing. And he said, please know you did nothing wrong. And I want to come back to this statement a little bit later because, um, no, I can, I can do it right here and right now. What I started to learn in saying I, did not some, I didn't do anything wrong was the first learning. I didn't do anything wrong. And my whole life, I had felt like I had to make up for this, that I had done something wrong. Just my existence brought this on me. And that having my son hold me in his arms and say that I got, I didn't do anything wrong. And where this brought me to course forgiveness is that it's allowed just this one piece of it. The courses which I've been struggling with, the course saying that forgiveness also shows this never happened. This never happened. And it's like, wait a second, this did happen in this level of illusion. But when I acknowledged that I didn't do anything wrong, I had to acknowledge I never did anything wrong. It never happened. My belief system, all these years that I did something wrong, actually wasn't true. It never happened. I didn't. And I suddenly got a glimpse of what true forgiveness was. This didn't even happen. On a deeper, most profound level, this didn't even happen. And I'm believing in it. But I still need to follow the journey of this illusion. And I was very clear that this man, this brother who I wanted to eviscerate is my holy relationship, my opportunity for a holy instant, a holy relationship. How can I do this within my own self and not teach him, but but move in a place of love and and not seeing us, you know, not seeing me as a victim. And in this, an aside, and I'm sorry, I'm like stepping aside, but another amazing thing happened with my son, which is that, you know, he's been telling me about his and even his generation's feeling of they, the pronoun they, and using they instead of he or she. And I got to understand a little bit in a more broad way why my son has not wanted to be associated with the he pronoun, because this is what gets thought of white male, like in his world. Uh, And he's not that he's so much more. And to see him choose the pronoun he to bring better to it is amazing. And I got this deep, like true understanding of at least my perspective of it, of all these, this next generation who don't want to be seen one or the other, want to move forward and and bring a different energetic love to what we are and perceptions of who we are, that it's not so characterized. So this also was a gift of this experience. But in any case, my friend Valerie said she wanted to report him to the police. And I was thinking the same, but I said, I need the opportunity to talk to this man because, and the biggest reason is because the other friend of mine who we're calling Sarah was who recommended him had a 12 year relationship with this man and friendship. So I called her up and I said, what's, what's your relationship? And she said, he's a, I always thought of him as a good man and I'm going to talk to him about this. And I'm sorry I didn't talk to him earlier, you know, but I really am now. And he's helped me through my some hard times in my life and divorce. And I need to talk to him. And I said, go ahead. And I am too. I need, I I trust that your love for this person absolutely um, deserves my 
opening up, but really my path deserves my coming and meeting this man in another way. And so I called him to make an appointment with him. And in that call, I didn't expect him to answer, but he called right after she had talked to him. And I started and I said, you know, Dylan, I need to explain something to you. And as I, he just immediately started to say, I just spoke with Sarah, something's going on here. Everything's turning upside down for me. I'm, I, this is really hard for me. I'm, and I'm so sorry. And I wasn't used to hearing that. I've heard, you know, abusers do not say they're sorry usually. And the sorry, like, took me by surprise. And he, what he started to say is, I've always, I thought that I was serving women and I've always trusted my intuition. And my intuition has told me, yes, he says, yes, I do give sensual massage for some of my clientele. And I, and I've gotten all, you know, support for doing this. And so my intuition wasn't working with you or with Valerie and what's going on. And he said, I'm really confused. And I said, let me tell you this as a child, I was a very, you know, I I had a truth meter and I still do with spirit. I have a truth meter when someone's, you know, giving me bull and not, you know, trying to give me a bill of sales, really, Um, even when they think that they're, you know, in truth, I have a truth meter. And the one place, and this is with, you know, general populace, the one place it never worked was with sociopaths. When I would enter sociopath realm, I remember this as a child, like, they believe their own lies so deeply that, the truth. I, I couldn't tell that it was a lie. And it was, and then I had to learn, oh, that's an actual, you know, there's a wound there. And in that particular wound, I have to learn to come at it differently. So I developed a sense of smell of a sociopath versus my intuitive insight that I would have for everyone else. And I said to this man, to Dylan, you know, you have these women on your table and first of all, no, I think the percentage is um, one out of every two women have, has been raped in our, in this culture here um, in the United States, which is an amazing, I think I have that statistic, right? But, uh, and also way more abused. And so you have women on these table and many are healthy, I'm sure, but there is a subset who, when this happens and they get triggered, sexually, they don't know how to say no. They don't know how to articulate it. They can be the most articulate people on the planet. But in this situation, they don't know how to say no. So your intuition is off because they're not healthy in that way. And your intuition that you were trusting, actually, it it was as me with the sociopaths. You know, it, it was wrong. And he fell to pieces. He felt he was sobbing so hard. And he was just saying, Oh, my God. Oh, my God, I have to stop my whole practice. Oh, my God. And the crying was opening my heart so much. And like part of me wanted to take care of him. Oh, it's okay. But I wouldn't say it. I knew not to say it. I, I knew his acknowledging it was what was so important at that moment. And I was just giving him love of like, thank you. Thank you for being someone who was hearing. And he was crying so hard that, that he said, can we talk another time when I can digest all of this? And I said, yes, I'd like that because I also wanted to measure what his other time, what happens in the space between It could be someone going, okay, got that. I cried, but you know what? Really, it wasn't so bad. Like a lot can happen. But I I said, yes, let's come back around this next week. And when I spoke to him, which was um, the day before yesterday, um, we doubled back. And And in that double back, this was a man 
Uh, my practice was to see him differently. And he helped open up seeing him differently in just that one acknowledgement. Um, and I was open and a little guarded. And I kept praying, please turn this over. Please turn this over. And I, you know, I got quotes from the course, which was the spark of holiness must be safe, however hidden it may be in every relationship. And that was one of the quotes from the text that really moved to me. And, and another was, for the instant of holiness is shared and cannot be yours alone. And that deeply, deeply spoke with me. And I kept feeding myself before this conversation with quotes about what this might be. And it's in the holy instant you see in each relationship what it will be when you perceive only the present. I was like, okay, I'm taking that with me. And all of your relationships are blessed in the holy instant because the blessing is not limited. I felt like I'd already experienced that and these pieces of that. And, um, and you know, I went into this next phone call fortified by course principles, uh, teaching my mind to not go where it was before. And when we got on the phone, my first question was, how are you? And his response was, I can't believe you're even asking me that. And I said, well, part of how you are is part of how I am. We're together in this. And he he started to open and say what this meant to him and how he had to stop everything, including his sensual, his sensual practice completely. Um, and I said, why did you have to go that black and white? Because I was prodding. Um, did you have to go that black and white and just stop that part of your practice? And he said, yes, because I'm turned so upside down and what I, I suddenly, my practice is a spiritual practice inside. And I'm thinking of myself as this gift to these women. And you showed me, oh my God, even the women who are coming to me, who think I'm helping them, this may be a trigger for them. They may be just continuing a cycle that they actually don't even want that, but that that's what they know. And I said, I, I said, you know, for me, it was, there was like Stockholm syndrome in that the people who abused me, I, I was a child and I wanted to love them. So I kept attracting other people to abuse me because I was, that's the love that I was taught. Um, oh, if they're abusive and I can help them transform, or if they're abusive and I can serve them because I know they're hurt, like all of these things, um, it really came up and he and I got to talk about it, but he kept going into what he was learning. And he said, you know, my life has been turned upside down and my work now is so hard and so difficult, but I need you to hear from me that you saved my life. And, you know, just that response, I said to him, you just opened mine, you know, we're in this together. And he said, I can't believe you're even talking to me. And I said, who would I rather talk to but you, someone who is hearing this? And he said, the way you came at me, um, he said, you didn't come, you came at me with righteous anger, but it wasn't self-righteous. And it was like a truth, like wake up. And he said, you yield, like, I want to read this so that I don't misquote it, but um, oh, can't find it. So I'm just going to say, he said, you wielded the hatchet very cleanly. And it wasn't like you were saying, you're bad and you're horrible. It was like you were saying, wake up, wake up, hear this. Like it, this is causing harm and it's not okay. And what I got, Dylan was saying, what I got from it was, oh my God, I'm wrong. I'm wrong in all my perceptions of myself. I'm wrong because my ego was involved 
And I did get a few comments from women that this was inappropriate. And I just wiped them away because I thought all the other comments, so many more, were thank you for helping me. Thank you for helping me with my body. But I've been wrong for me. And I said, does it need to be about right or wrong? And he said, yes, because this was wrong. And I need to say that before I can move into what's right, what feels in alignment. And you didn't come at me angry. Like, and you didn't come at me angry because you, but you showed me your hurt and that I didn't, I do know this is wrong though. And I just, you know, I just said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being this person. I feel like you may end up being the safest masseuse on the planet now. And he said, I can't even believe you're saying that to me. Like, this is forgiveness. This is truth. And my partner getting to see the ramifications of hurt, sadness, pain, suffering of the women, and and even between he and myself, the energy that it created, that voice that he, that taunts him, he is stronger in being able to go, no, thank you. I'm actually seeing what this is. No, thank you. That's wrong in moving in love, in choosing love. That doesn't feel like it's in alignment. So in all of this, um, and there's many other deeper parts to it. I mean, this man wrote to Valerie and said, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. And she got a real apology. And this woman who was so angry and she was calling the police she called me, she went, I hadn't even told her yet what the opening that happened between him and me. And she called and she said, he wrote an apology and it was sincere. And I don't want to call the police. I want to watch. And I said, yeah, yeah. Like here she is so angry and it just spread. It spread to her. And the person who recommended him in the first place, Sarah, was like, we partnered together. Thank you. Thank you for our being able to partner and open an awareness and the the extensions of it in that we are all one and we are all connected. Here it is right here. I th- This man still can't believe it, but I love him. I'm so glad for him on this planet. And I want to read something because my partner and I, who were, have been doing the workbook together, We finished the workbook lessons and there was something that we read together this morning and I want to share this. And it is characteristics of God's teachers. And we're at the fourth characteristic, which is gentleness. And says, harm is impossible for God's teachers. They can neither harm nor be harmed. Harm is the outcome of judgment. It's, it is the dishonest act that follows a dishonest thought. It is a verdict of guilt upon a brother and therefore on oneself. It is the end of peace and the denial of learning. It demonstrates the absence of God's curriculum and its replacement by insanity. No teacher of God but must learn. And fairly early in his training, that harmfulness completely obliterates his function from his awareness. It will make him confused, fearful, angry, and suspicious. It will make the Holy Spirit's lessons impossible to learn, nor can God's teacher be heard at all, except by those who realize that harm can actually achieve nothing. No gain can come of it. Therefore, God's teachers are wholly gentle, They need the strength of gentleness, for it is in this that the function of salvation becomes easy. To those who would do harm, it is impossible. To those to whom harm has no meaning, it is merely natural. What choice but this has meaning to the same? Who chooses hell when he perceives a way to heaven? And who would choose the weakness that must come from harm in place of the unfailing, all-encompassing and limitless strength of gentleness. The might of God's teachers 
lies in their gentleness, for they have understood their evil thoughts come neither from God's son nor his creator. Thus did they join their thoughts with him who is their source. And so their will, which always was his own, is free to be itself. And the last thing I want to say in this is what wove through this story for me is I went with my partner four years ago to the Women's March. And we went to San Francisco. And I was a little suspect of him coming with me because I didn't like how he perceived women, uh, even though he thought he was a good man. I was I knew that voice was there that I never liked. So how dare he march with women when he has that voice? Uh, not realizing that every single man, you know, probably also has that to an extent. Uh, it's been trained and indoctrined, as he said. And we went to the march and we were way far back. So we couldn't hear any of the words being said from the podium. And I noticed there was a lot of white women there, mostly white women and, you know, some... Asian women, uh, but it felt like it felt more white. And I heard these women speaking on the platform who seemed to be white. And all I could hear was, bah, 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 and everyone yelling. Bah! And the tone was so angry. And I knew if I heard those words, I would be going bah! with all the other women. But the tone was angry, like, it, and it was, you know, Me Too movement coming in and, and no more and stop. And, and I, my body started to shake a bit. And I said to my partner after an hour of this, like, I'm not hearing anything and I'm not feeling anything but riled. Can we go back to Oakland where he lives? And we got on BART and we came out of BART and in the street was a parade of all of these women of color dancing in the streets and they were dancing and one grabbed me and I was dancing with them. And there were women, there were men on the sidelines and even amidst the women who were cheering them on and dancing. And it was like these women to me were going, we've been raped. We've been pillaged. We've been slaves. We've been this. We don't need to scream about it anymore. We are empowered. And that's the experience that this whole thing is teaching me of what forgiveness is, is just being love. That's what's real. None of this needs to have happened or really even did, but it still needs to be honored in this level of illusion to move it through and out and back to love. That's the dance between the dream and the dreamer. Wow. Thanks so much for sharing that, Tam. That the, I, you know, I can feel the raw emotion there. Um, something I was hearing when you're hearing your talk, I'm hearing the emotion, and then you have the course principles over here, and then you have the emotion, and then I'm wondering <laughs> how do you integrate these two things? Uh, and then as the story progressed, I heard how you integrated these these two things, and I was. I was thinking, how, how, how can you integrate? But uh, that was a, a beautiful story of healing. And so you asked early on, I heard, you know, how, how can I see this differently? And it sounds like by the end you have, but also there is a, um, a portal or a, like a radiating connection to other people in the story. And they had healing too. You're never healed by yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's even more far reaching than that, um, you know, to, to my mother who can speak for her experience in it to, you know, it, it just, it doesn't stop. And that's why, even though you asked me in the beginning, as I said, you know, is this too raw right now? It's important to tell it while it is still raw, where there's not an objective past from it, you know, where I, I, couch it all up and make it into a nice little story. This is the feelings are still here and it is diligent. You know, I have it like it's coming up in so many other areas in my life 
and it's giving me a frame of reference. Oh, think of that one that way too, because you would be reactive to that one. Oh, slow it down. Think, let this one be an opportunity where that person's out of the box, whether they're male or female. Like it doesn't, you know, women can be abusive too to each other. I've been abusive. You know, I react in anger. You know, how can this practice of the course teach you that, you know, daily lessons, reading, rem- it's just a reminder how to come out of the box and come back to love. And it's really hard sometimes, really, really hard. Yeah, I agree. You know, Tam and, and Matt, I'm a little bit emotional right now because it's my daughter sitting next to me and I'm hearing this story in which I hear so much truth and so much forgiveness and so much, let's say, going in the way that would be helpful through the course. A whole bunch of of quotes from the course that came up, which I will not give now because I think we've gotten so much from Tam, I don't want to dilute it. But I will say this, that as I'm listening to her after 46 years of studying A Course in Miracles, Two things came to mind. One was talking to Bill Thetford, who was co-scribe of A Course in Miracles, and I was asking him for guidance. And I say, how do you know how well you're doing with this? There are no tests you can take or anything. And he smiled and he said, it depends upon how long you hold a grievance. And this particular story that Tam has told us, which is so recent, And she dealt with it, I would say, so quickly shows that the work that she's been doing with the course has really begun to set. I don't mean just understood, but set within her so that she does not want to hold a grievance very long at all and is not. And the other thing that came to me is something very quick. It says, whom you forgive is free. And what you give, you share. So in forgiving someone in the way of non-duality, in forgiving someone and recognizing that we are living in a dream, we are sharing a dream. This dream is an illusion that we have made. Therefore, what we think happened didn't really happen because we are safe where we belong with our creator. That that tells us so much that what you give, you share. She gave forgiveness to this person. He felt the forgiveness and therefore he felt freed and so did she. May I add in here too that in this, If I denied it, if I went straight to, you know, spiritual override, none of, it depends. Obviously, if I were an enlightened being and just was able to do it without any effort and knew who I am completely, then it's already healed. It's already forgiven, which it is also. Um, But in, in just the going through it, the depth of intimacy that I got to experience in relationship with one woman who wanted to ban with me and like, okay, we're going to go to the police. And then her forgive, like watching that forgiveness and the other so grateful that I wasn't sending a man to prison who was a friend of hers for 12 years and had helped her through hard times and grateful, but never asking me not to, not for a second, not asking me not to, but also my own body which had triggers in this, my own body that shut down. How did I look at this? And there is a course quote that helped me there, which was the laws of sin demand a victim. And thus is the body healed by miracles because they show the mind made sickness and employed the body to be victim or effect of what it made. And embracing that like cellularly, my body can bring in forgiveness and the two can be integrated and meet to release. So my body doesn't have to hold this is okay. You're forgiving, but I'm still remembering. 
uh, it has to come in every level together. And this is where the course can bring understanding. And, and I can read this same line in 10 years, and I promise I'm going to understand it way deeper than I do now, which is why when you say, who, who am I and what do I do? I do this. And that means I never know who I am <laughs> until each moment in the present. Wow. Well, you had it My so much. Is laughing. She's not <laughs> crying. I want you to know she's giggling next to me. <laughs> you had so much context there, uh, Tam, that I really, I don't even have any other questions or comments. That was uh, an amazing story of healing and forgiveness and powerful, really powerful. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thank you for listening. Sure. It matters. What you guys are doing, it, it matters because all these different flavors of stories, all these different ways to come back to how there's a tool. You know, there are other tools out there that resonate more for other people, but this tool, if you use it, it really does do what it says it does, which is bring you back to love. Funny enough here, my, uh, my ACIM app just popped up. And several times an hour, love holds no grievances. That? Yeah. It's a good one. <laughs> it's a hard one, but it's a good one. <laughs> yeah. And and this man, I just want to say at the end of all of this, this this man, Dylan, uh, I gave him that name because it means beginning and light uh coming in, the the light of dawn too. Uh but he uh he asked, we both asked each other. Can we keep in touch? Can we keep in touch? Let's let's look at each other's progress. And he like he said, I want you to like be a voice that goes, ah, you're not you're hello, you know, come back. And and I said to him, vice versa. I want to this is beautiful. You could call me on anything now, too. You know, it leveled the playing field. We weren't separate. <laughs> it just leveled it. Wow. She's laughing again. She's laughing at your wows, just so you know. Well, I mean, I don't know. Judy, do you, do you have any thoughts or comments or anything you'd like to share? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I turn that upside down and you know what it is? Mom. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's mom. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Oh, yes. I've got this incredible partner here that has helped me in the, on this path. Yeah, as I do, because it's equal. (laughs) Well, I want to thank Tam for agreeing to be on this podcast with us. And Matt, I always want to thank you for being my partner, because without you, I wouldn't know what to do (laughs) with a podcast. (laughs) So uh, we've had some very interesting discussions and I just hope, pray that we will continue because I find them helpful to me. Me too. Very helpful. This has been a wonderful episode. Thank you so much, Tam. Thank you, Judy. And for anybody else that's listening, if you have any topics you'd like us to cover or questions about the course or things you're struggling with, please just go to miraclevoices.org and to the contact tab and just fill out that form and we'd be happy to try to address those on future episodes. But for now, Tam, thanks so much for sharing your miracle voice. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.